insulted him, abused him, hit his family members, right? Attacked his close friends, and you know, <coughs> were the cause of the martyrdom of his very close family members. And, you know, he forgave them. Again, Sultan Salahuddin Ayyubi, acting upon the Sunnah, he forgave the oppressors, the Christians who took the Christian kings from Europe, who went and uh, took the uh, Holy Land. And Sultan Salah al-Din rahimahullah ta'ala, when he liberated the Holy Land, with the dua of Shaykh Abdul Qadir al-Jilani, Ghazi Azam radiallahu anhu. In the dua of Sultan al-Awliya, Ghazi Azam Abdul Qadir al-Jilani radiallahu when he liberated the Holy Lands, he forgave his enemies. And again, when we see after the Spanish Inquisition, when the Muslims and Jews were subject to either death, either expulsion, or either forcibly, forcibly being baptized. What did the Muslims do? When the Jews were fleeing from Muslim Spain, or former Muslim Spain, Catholic Spain now, the Jews sought refuge in Bosnia, in Istanbul, in Turkey, in Salonika, in Morocco, and other various parts of the world. But they sought refuge with the Muslims, because the Muslims have always been tolerant of the Jews. And Sultan Ahmad ta'ala, of the Turks, the Ottoman Emperor, when he mentioned that the action of uh, Ferdinand and Isabella, the Catholic monarchs of Spain, in expelling the Jews, they have in fact impoverished Spain and they have enriched the Muslim Empire. So he accepted them with open arms. So Muslims have always been tolerant of other faiths. Now the reason why I am speaking of this subject today of tolerance and of the attitude of Muslims towards other faiths, you will know the backdrop of this talk. Namely, the cartoons, the disrespectful cartoons, the images, the depictions in the Charlie Hebdo, Charlie Hebdo depictions. Now, as Muslims, we know no one may take the law into their own hands. Islam does not condone terrorism. Islam does not condone terrorism. No one has the right to go of his own accord and kill anyone. If anyone is to kill or execute, it is the state the government, the Islamic uh, Sultanate, so as to say. Any uh, legal punishment, any penal uh, code, or any form of punishment and uh, retribution is only to be carried out by the authorities. No individual has a right to go and kill and cause unwanted destruction and damage. However, the issue here is freedom of expression and the limitations of freedom of expression. Article 10 of the European Convention on Human Rights highlights the freedom of expression. I have it written in detail, but just to mention the gist of it, that everyone has the right to freedom of expression. And in the second uh, part of this article, it mentions that this, the exercise of this article carries with it duties and responsibilities and may be subject to formalities, conditions, Restrictions or penalties, restrictions or penalties, as are prescribed by law and as are necessary in a democratic society in the interests of national security, territorial integrity, public safety, for the pre prevention of disorder or crime, for the protection of health or morals, for the protection of reputation or rights of others, for preventing the disclosure of information received in confidence, or for maintaining the authority and impartiality of the judiciary. Now there are obviously limitations to the law of freedom of speech, freedom of expression. By no means is it an means, by no means is it an unfettered right without any restriction. It's not just you know li limitless freedom that like you can say what you want, do what you want, and that's it. No. There are obviously restrictions. And every government also restricts speech. Every government restricts speech. Why? There are common limitations. If you look in defamation laws, sedition laws, professional and journalistic standards, libel, slander, obscenity, hate speech, incitement, fighting words, classified information, so on and so forth, the list goes on and on. And importantly, public security, public order are amongst the reasons for which free speech is limited. It is limited and is restricted due to these various reasons. 
Whether these limitations can be justified under the harm principle depends upon whether influencing a third party's opinions or actions adversely to the second party constitutes such harm or not. Then there is the term of the offense principle. When something causes offense to another person. The offense principle is also used to expand the range of free speech limitations to prohibit forms of expression where they are considered offensive to society. Where they are considered offensive to society or special interest groups or to individuals. For example, freedom of speech is limited in many jurisdictions to widely differing agree uh, degrees by religious legal systems, religious offense, or incitement to ethnic or racial hatred laws. So again, the freedom of speech, the freedom of expression is not unlimited and unfettered. However, it is subject to restrictions based on security, safety, and the important right not to be insulted. The important right of not to be insulted. And this is why here in the UK we also have the public law, public order act, which makes it an offense to use any threatening, abusive or insulting words. Threatening, abusive or insulting words. And again, <coughs> You're going to think that it's going through all this legal jargon, but inshallah, I'll get to the point of it. Why? Article 9 of the European Convention. Again, freedom of thought, conscience, and religion. The freedom of everyone, the right of everyone to express their religious faith. This, again, is another fundamental right in the European Convention on Human Rights, in the Charter. So now, the key, the key question arises that we are all thinking. Upon the implementation of these provisions is where exactly do we draw the line? Who decides how far freedom can go? Who decides? The answer, unfortunately the answer, is that it is those who are in power who set the limits. Those who are in power, they ultimately set the limits of what can constitute freedom and what cannot. What makes an offence, what does not make an offence. So it is those in power who set the limits seeking to impose, dominate, and exploit others. <coughs> Evidence is from the practice. Let's look at the practical examples. Given the fact that the European Court of Human Rights in Article 9 safeguards and upholds the freedom of thought, conscience, and religion, including the expression of religion, a case was brought by a 24-year-old French woman who argued that the ban on wearing the veil in public violated her freedom of religion and expression. French law says that nobody can wear in public space a clothing intended to conceal the face, a burqa. And you know what the penalty is? The penalty for doing so can be a 150 euro fine, a 120 pound fine. And you know the European court ruled in favor of the law. It upheld this law. Even though we as Muslims see it as discrimination to our expression of our faith. Our faith, which according to some ulama, you can wear a hijab, a woman, according to other fuqaha, she must wear the veil. It is a religious expression of faith. But again, it has a limitation. It has limitation. Again, in 16 countries in Europe, it is illegal to deny the Holocaust. To deny that the Holocaust occurred. This is illegal. Anyone who says that the Holocaust did not happen, in Austria, Belgium, Czech Republic, France, Germany, and other countries as well in Europe, what happens? Criminal offense. It is criminalized. Again, this is another limitation. The Danish cartoonists, a year before they published the insulting and derogatory cartoons of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but they're not of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I take that back. Supposedly in their imagination, they are depicting him, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. But he, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, Allah says, "What a fa'na laka For you, we have raised your remembrance. So no matter how much they try to insult or tarnish or blemish his blessed and beloved reputation, there is no way or form that they can do so. However, it was their attempt, their attempt to insult. So those depictions, a year before they depicted those cartoons, a year before they did this. They were going to also do the same for Sayyidina Wa Nabina Isa Jesus Christ. But they took that back. 
They do not do this. Why? Because they thought it would provoke outrage. But we ask, why does it not provoke outrage? We are against the depiction of Sayyidina Isa as well. We are against the depiction of any of the Anbiya والسلام, and we are against the insult to any faith and any religious order. We are against the insult to anyone. We do not mock or insult anyone of any faith of any kind. Particularly the insult to the Prophets, the Anbiya والسلام, who Deen Islam holds very high, the Anbiya والسلام, on their honor. And we are against the dishonoring of Sayyidina Isa Islam, but we raise the question, why is it that the same company, the same newspaper was able to go unchecked when it produced the uh, cartoons supposedly depicting the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Nothing happened, which is okay. So we witness a dual standard. Again, we raise the question that what happened to the French magazine? Thousands of people marching, just be Charlie. We are Charlie, we are with him, we are with this magazine. Right? This is an expression of freedom. However, I raise the question that what would happen, and it's not that I support this, but I raise this question, that if somebody crudely depicted the Holocaust, and I'm not advocating this, but theoretically speaking, then what would the consequences be? If somebody drew some cartoons, mocking and, uh, you know, mocking the Holocaust, right? What would the consequences be? How would the European government, how would the West react to this? Would it be seen as a freedom of expression or anti-Semitism? Again, what can be said of referring to black people, for example, African people with the N-word, right? Or again, using derogatory pictures to insult. What would it be? Racism, of course, it would be racism. It would be unacceptable. It is below the standard of morally accepted behavior. We do not insult. As human beings, it's a basic civil principle. We teach our children, don't insult, don't swear, don't mock anyone, right? Don't harm others and don't be harmed. La darara wa la dirar. Hadith Sharif of Nabi alayhi salatu salam. So again, but when it comes to the cartoons against Islam, free speech. Free speech. Who draws the line? So in recent days, I just want to bring another point to your notice. All of you may know that Pope Francis, the head of the Vatican, he did mention, it is stated, and I quote, if my good friend, Dr. Gaspari, says a curse word against my mother, he can, ex he can expect a punch. Francis said half jokingly, throwing a mock punch his way. And then he goes on to say, it is normal. You cannot provoke. You cannot insult the faith of others. You cannot make, faith, make fun of the faith of others. These are his words. And understandably, these are his words. We as Muslims, we accept intellectual debate. We accept dialogue. We accept critique and reasoning. We openly welcome dialogue. However, insults, derogatory depictions, and outright mockery of any religious faith is totally unacceptable. It is totally unacceptable. What reason is that in doing this? Does it serve any purpose? Is there any intellectual uh, argument in this? Is there any form of reasoning or debate in this? Of course not. No. What is the intention in this? Nothing other than the insult. The insult of our faith. So again, we demand reasons and limitations. Where do we draw the line? But just to mention another point, again going back to limitation and freedom of expression, you will know that in recent weeks, the French government has banned protests for the Palestinian freedom, for the freedom of Gaza and Palestine. Again, we question why? Why? This is a totally unrelated issue to the depictions in Charlie Hebdo. This is a totally unrelated issue. The freedom for the people of al quds al-Sharif, of Palestine and of Gaza is a totally unrelated issue. Again, why have the Muslims been banned? And why have also non-Muslims? There are sympathetic Jews. Jews who are not Zionists, Jews who follow the Torah and the teachings of Sayyidina Musa Islam, who they try to follow, them people have also joined the protests in support of the Palestinian state and the recognition of the state of Palestine. Jewish people, Christian people, people of other faiths, people of every race, color and creed have come out. Is this not an infringement of human rights for the French government to limit 
their freedom of expression and this allow them to come out and speak for the freedom and for the uh, for the liberation of oppressed women oppressed children and oppressed elderly people is this not an injustice and gross unfairness i ask is this not gross unfairness of course it is so again we see the double standards so in fact provocation in form of these cartoons and depictions is a very dangerous step we indeed as muslims we condemn terrorism but we again we do not condone provoking terrorism we do not condone this either we condemn terrorism but we do not condone the provocation of them and we do not say that they should be given the time of day why give them the time of day why we need as a human society we need to respect and have dignity and respect others and expect to be respected if we as human society cannot do this living in this modern age then the future is only going to be bleak and worse if we as a human society cannot rise above the level of insults and the level of intolerance then what is going to happen to our future generations what is going to happen to our future generations already the world is burning and bleeding so again it is a plea a plea to those in power to have fear of allah to have fear of allah azza wa jal and to have some moral sense even if you don't believe in allah have some moral sense of right and wrong and to refrain and show fairness and show fairness in everything that we do insults offer nothing to society they offer nothing to society but they only further dividing the pluralistic and diverse society which we live in again they only cause hate and division all beliefs must be protected including allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the sanctity of god the sanctity of allah and of his messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam and of all his prophets so god will be peace the sanctity must be respected so in practice to some of freedom of expression is arguably used as a political tool selectively by the elite to further their own gains we can see when it comes to certain crimes certain forms of freedom of expression certain forms of expression they are seen as crime and antisemitism and racism and discrimination on religious and racial grounds however when other forms of discrimination against the blessed and holy personality of the master of creation the best of creation the most beautiful of creation the most noble of creation the mercy to the entire world the one who is the perfected the perfected character the perfection perfecter of morals the perfecter of human dignity and character would without doubt the most influential and the most uh, the most loved and followed and remembered of all personalities of human history our beloved and master leader sayyidina rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam our beloved master sallallahu alaihi wasallam we do not accept any insults and any derogatory remarks made against his blessed personality we do not we do not accept this as muslims as human beings we cannot accept this we cannot accept this and again we must voice our concerns we must voice our concerns in light of the facts that there is unfortunately a double standard when other faiths or the races are insulted then it is religious and racial discrimination but when the prophet of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam is abused or insulted it is okay it is freedom right this is hypocrisy and we need to voice our concerns as citizens of this state we all have a right to speak and to voice our concerns there is an online petition wherein everyone can sign and voice their concern and demand that the british government draws a line a line which is common for all not just selective and partial in its application but for everyone to abide by so that not only the rights of others but the rights of muslims are also protected it is a fundamental right of every human being let alone muslim of every human being in order to to be respected and to be honored and to have his own freedom of faith and expression of faith so ultimately as muslims what can we do in these troubled times we must turn to the sunnah of the blessed of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam the 
chosen messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Allah azza wa jal says, لَقَدْ قَالَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةً حَسَنًا That indeed for you, in the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the best example. We must learn his sunnah. We must teach his sunnah to our children and we must display his morals and his character to the non-Muslims, to the people of the faiths so that they can see the real beauty of Islam. No matter how much these people are trying to denigrate and dishonor and lower the dignity of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa as I am speaking now, I can guarantee you that thousands and in fact millions around the world will be doing their own research and learning about Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and they will be seeing the truth with their own eyes. That he sallallahu alayhi wa was without doubt the best of creation and the greatest of mankind sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But what do we Muslims have to do as individuals, as a society? We must turn to the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And we must take his message forward. We must pray our salah, be punctual in our salah, teach our children adab, frequent our masajid, follow his sunnah, learn his sunnah, spread the message of deen. It is a duty upon all of us. Allah Azza wa Jal will ask us, what did you do? What did you do? What can we do? We can only speak in this moment and time. Allahu Akbar. And this is why, myself foremost, I seek the forgiveness of Allah Azza wa Jal. And I say, Ya Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I seek your forgiveness. In that I have not been able to fulfill your right. I have not been able to defend you. I have not been able to defend you justly. And I have not been able to stand up for your honor. But Ya Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the least I can do is speak for you. The least we can do is all speak for you. And we can we can celebrate your maulid and we can propagate your sunnah and we can spread your message of love. Ya Rasulullah Ismaqalana, Ya Habib Allah Ismaqalana, Inna na fi bahri ham min mughraqun, Khud yadi sahillana ashkalana. And ending with the words of Sayyidina Sultan al Awliya, Abdul Qadir al Jilani, Radila Anhu. I say these words and I end my bayan and I say to Allah to forgive us and have mercy on us and give the Muslim Ummah that strength and that ghayrah and that izzah again and that honor again in following the sunnah of the best of creation sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive me and all of us and have mercy upon the Ummah of Rasulullah alayhi wa sallam. Wa akhirat da'waya alayhi wa sallam.